There's more mischief, mayhem, and nefarious goings-on in the city of brotherly love than Billy Penn could have ever imagined. We've got it all here on the Twisted Philly Podcast. True crime, haunted history, the coolest and creepiest places to visit. Welcome, Welcome to, to Twisted, Twisted Philly. Philly. Hey Twisters, what up? It's been a little over a month since I launched Twisted Philly and the show is closely approaching 2,000 downloads in just about five weeks. From a podcast statistic, I don't have a freaking clue if that's good for just a few weeks, but from my own personal perspective, I'm sitting here like, holy shit, I've got almost 2,000 downloads. Yeah, there are some shows that are so good and have been on for so long they're up to millions of downloads and I'm probably listening to them. But for now, I'm happy being the little podcast who could, and I will take my 2,000 downloads. The crazy thing is that Twisted Philly has listeners from all over the world. This week, Australia surpassed the UK in Twisted Philly listeners. We've got listeners in Canada, Ireland, Sweden, and Iceland. You guys get many, many what-ups this week. I don't know who you are, but I am so happy to have you. If you're on Twitter or Facebook, make sure you reach out and say hello. You can find me on Twitter at Twisted underscore Philly and on Facebook either at Twisted Philly or Twisted Philly Podcast, which is our discussion group. I'm so happy to have you guys. So what up all over the world? In this episode, I want to talk about neighbors and a story of feuding neighbors that is so creepy and twisted, it gave me chills. I am really lucky when it comes to neighbors. I've lived in my house with my daughter for over 11 years and I live in a townhouse, so I'm attached. The family on the right is just a wonderful family with whom we've become friends. They've been here long before I moved in. My old neighbors on the other side moved away a few months ago, but they were great too. Living in a townhouse and being attached, it makes such a difference to feel connected to people in your cluster and especially to people on either side of you. A few months ago, we got some new neighbors on one side and I was a little worried because shortly after somebody moved in, there was a knock at my door at 8 a.m. on a Sunday, and the new neighbor asked me to turn down my TV. Honestly, I was shocked. In over 11 years, no one had complained about noise or anything else coming from my house. And it's not like I was watching Apocalypse Now or something super loud. I was watching Pride, Prejudice, and Zombies. Okay, do not start dissing that movie. No, it wasn't as great as the book, but I love Pride and Prejudice and I love zombies, so the combination of the two is one of my greatest joys. And it wasn't anywhere near as bad as Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. The movie wasn't a complete bag of shit. It was more like what you experience when you take a pet for a walk. Most of the time your walk is enjoyable and occasionally you have to stop and pick up a turd, but you don't mind because you love your pet. Most of Pride, Prejudice, and Zombies was more than enjoyable, but, you know, here and there, there was an occasional turd in the story or the action that you had to deal with. The problem that I had with the movie, though, and this is what may have aggravated my neighbor, was that the audio editing sucked. Every action scene, the volume jumped so loud. Every few minutes, you were adjusting the volume, and not just little adjustments, but these were big adjustments in volume. And as I share this story with you, I'm thinking, oh shit, I hope Twisted Philly listeners don't have to do this because I know sometimes I get really loud. So if you do, I would totally understand if that is an annoying pain in the ass. But I'm not a highly paid Hollywood audio engineer, as I would expect was working on Pride, Prejudice, and Zombies. Even though I knew the sound in the movie sucked, I was still a little surprised that someone complained. But maybe she's never lived attached before, and if you haven't, a little adjustment is necessary. And you know what? She just recently moved in. She didn't know me. Maybe she was setting her boundaries early on. The development where I live does not have an association fee, which I really like, and we're lucky that the majority of residents maintain their properties very well. They keep up on their lawns and their trees. There's no problems. Although a few years ago, there was a unit on the other side of my development, which sat up on a hill, and their front yard was a bit of a hill too. So they planted these large slanted flower beds on their front lawn, which at first were really lovely. And then six months go by and the plants start to look like somebody was growing weed there. They moved a few years ago, so I'm not dissing anyone who lives there now. Neighbors can be a great asset. They can be a terrific source of support and friendship, or they can be quiet, they can keep to themselves, all of which is also absolutely fine. In some cases though, you could get stuck with the neighbor from hell. 
And that's what happened when Roy Kirk moved in next door to Ann Hoover in the Oakland neighborhood of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, back in the 90s. Before you start giving me shit because I'm talking about Pittsburgh and not something closer to Philly, please remember the first episode when I said that this podcast is about all things twisted in the city of brotherly love and Pennsylvania at large. I also said we might travel a little further to talk about twisted shit. So that's what we're doing today. We're getting in our cars, we're jumping on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, stopping to make sure we have enough money in our wallets to pay to get across the state in case you don't have Easy Pass. That's what's twisted about Pennsylvania. It costs more to get across our state than it does to get across half the entire country because of our Turnpike tolls. Today, the Oakland neighborhood is a thriving community. It's filled with museums and universities. There's great shopping, there's terrific restaurants. Oakland is actually the third largest commercial area in the state, just behind downtown Pittsburgh and Center City, Philadelphia. It's an incredibly diverse community, and there's so many young people because University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon are right near Oakland. There's botanical gardens, there's beautiful parks. Oakland is a city that's called international, cultural, and educational. 20 years ago in the 90s, Oakland was going through a bit of a resurgence in some neighborhoods with people buying older properties to fix them up, either to live in them themselves or to flip them for a profit. Ann Hoover was 44 years old, and she lived at 321 Lawn Street in the Oakland section of Pittsburgh, not too far from the Monongahela River. Ann, with the help of her family, invested considerable time and energy into refurbishing her nearly 100-year-old row home. Initially, Ann rented the property, but eventually she purchased it, and after she bought it, she completely remodeled the home. She turned it into a little show place. Ann lived alone with her poodle, Nikki. She had a terrific appreciation for music. She often volunteered to help raise funds for the Pittsburgh Symphony. Music appreciation was a huge part of her life. She was friendly with her neighbors, and she was active in a neighborhood association. And it wasn't like a formal homeowners association. It was more of a club that the neighbors in her Oakland neighborhood came together and formed just to focus on creative ideas on what they could do to beautify their neighborhood. Anne's home was attached. It was a row house. And on one side, it was attached to a vacant property. That was purchased by a man named Roy Kirk in 1992. So Anne and her neighbors were thrilled when somebody bought the property. It had been vacant and abandoned for so long, it was in a serious state of disrepair, and everybody was really hopeful that Roy's house would soon be on the mend. Roy was invited to join their neighborhood association. From the start, Roy was really energetic. He had lots of great, creative, interesting ideas. And all indications are that Anne and Roy were pretty amicable neighbors shortly after he took over the property adjacent to hers. The challenge, though, for Roy was that he was managing the repairs himself, unlike Anne, who was using contractors. And even though Roy had his own company that bought properties at sheriff's sale and then refurbished them, he was short on cash because he had bought eight properties throughout Pittsburgh. He was also short on skill when it came to plumbing, electricity, even general repairs. So the expectation that most of the neighbors had that they would soon see the benefits of a new homeowner in his property really did not come true anytime soon. And Roy couldn't live in the house next door to Anne. It was so uninhabitable when he bought it that he actually lived in one of the properties he owned down the street at 311 Lawn Street. Roy was trying to refurbish multiple properties, and that takes a lot of time and a lot of money. Initially, Anne and most of the other neighbors were pretty patient, but after a few years, the property at 323 Lawn Street continued to be an eyesore, and they started to complain. As you could probably expect, because she was attached to him, Anne was the most vocal, and You know, I can't say I blame her. Roy left so much trash and debris on his lawn. And these were small properties. They were maybe 1,400 square feet with really small front yards and rear yards. So everything that he tossed onto his lawn eventually began to spill over onto Anne's property. Trash breeds bugs, trash breeds vermin, like roaches and rats. And that's what showed up. There were rats inside and outside his home. He wasn't maintaining the lawn, so there were horrible weeds growing feet high, and there was no electricity or water at this house, which just further complicated his efforts to restore the property. Eventually, after a few years of Anne complaining to Roy, she began complaining to the health department. But when she did, she learned the health department had already fined him in September of 1996 for trash and debris at another property on Lawn Street. Then the housing authority stepped in, and Roy got cited for building code violations. One of the biggest issues affecting Ann Hoover's property was damage from the adjacent roof at Roy Kirk's house. Ann repeatedly asked him to fix the roof. The damage to his roof was so extensive, and some of it was self-inflicted. Roy ripped off the drain spouts, he ripped off a huge portion of the shingles, with the best of intentions that he would fix it himself, but then he never got around to it. 
Anne put so much love and effort into her home, and she was spending months dealing with water damage because of Roy's leaky roof. At one point, she offered to buy the property from Roy. She offered to help him with roof repairs. She even offered to have one of her contractors come over and fix it for him. And he repeatedly turned her down. He took it as an insult, almost as if she thought he wasn't man enough to handle his own affairs. It had nothing to do with his masculinity. It had everything to do with just get up off your ass and fix your house. Roy continued to find himself in deeper trouble with the city. His neighbors were complaining. The health department continued to fine him for failing to address their citations. And then the housing magistrate started to levy fines against him as well. So he didn't have enough money to address the damage at his properties. And now that situation was compounded because any money he might have had would have to pay fines. After months of complaints and citations, Roy had accumulated over $40,000 worth of fines across eight properties in the Oakland neighborhood and other sections of Pittsburgh. The only thing Roy had going for him was that his taxes on all eight properties were current, so the state or city couldn't come in and take the properties out from underneath him. By March 1997, Anne and other neighbors on Lawn Street were scheduled to appear in court to give testimony against Roy Kirk. And this was an important event, not just for those neighbors, but also for Roy, because this was an opportunity for him to appeal the fines and tell his side of the story, if there really was any side for him to tell. And there's conflicting stories about Anne. There's some friends and neighbors who felt Anne's frustrations were warranted. You know, certainly if my neighbor or your neighbor's house was causing water damage to our home, we'd probably be pretty fucking pissed off if we spent months begging them to fix it. Other accounts, though, say that Anne was pretty harsh out of the gate, and she was relentless in her comments and complaints, and that her behavior almost bordered on harassing Roy about his adjacent home. And it wasn't just that one court appearance on March 11th in 1997 that was an issue. According to Pittsburgh's chief magistrate, a gentleman named William Simmons, Anne Hoover took Roy Kirk to court eight times in one year over the leaky roof. Besides the roof, there were other problems with the property that were just generally bringing down property values on Lawn Street. No one really wanted him spending money on fines when he could be using money to fix up the house. The morning of March 11th, Ann Hoover's friend, Rose Liptak, and a few other neighbors went to Ann's house to pick her up for court. Rose was surprised when Ann didn't answer the front door, but she thought maybe Ann left early and took herself to court. Rose drove the neighbors to the courthouse, and when she realized neither Anne nor Roy had showed up for the hearing that morning, she doubled back to Anne's house. Once she arrived there, she learned that another neighbor had climbed into Anne Hoover's house. This neighbor was worried that maybe Anne hurt herself and couldn't get to the door, but she wasn't there. In addition to friends and neighbors, Anne's parents were also at the courthouse. They knew this was an incredibly important day for her, and they wanted to be there to support her. They were really worried when Anne didn't show up. They caught a ride from a friend to Anne's house. And when her mother went in the house and saw Anne's purse and keys and coat, she knew something terrible must have happened. And go ask your mom. She would probably freak out if she got to your house and you weren't there, but your coat and your purse and your keys were. Okay, I guess that's more for women. So guys, your mom would probably be upset if you weren't in your house, but your wallet and your keys were, right? There's just certain things you never leave home without. So the family called the police, and around 9 a.m., Pittsburgh police showed up. They searched Ann Hoover's home, but there was no sign of her. Because neither Ann nor Roy showed up at court, Rose suggested to police that they look next door at Roy's house. She told police about the bad feelings between Roy and Ann, and she told them that she was also scared for Ann's safety. The description of the interior of Roy Kirk's home reminded me of corpse collector Harrison Marty Graham. It was filthy. There was dirt, there was debris, there was trash, there were no lights or electricity. Some of the windows were boarded up. The first officer inside was a man named Ed Drudy. Now, Officer Drudy moved through the house, and he sees Roy Kirk walking up the hallway from the back of the house. Roy was wearing pants, but nothing else. And he was covered with dirt and what looked like blood. And he's agitated. He wants to know why the police are at his house. So Officer Drudy explains, we came looking for you when you didn't show up at court. Officer Judy escorts Roy outside and asks the other officers who were there with them to keep an eye on him. He heads back in the house and notices there's a large extension cord running in from the outside. There was no electricity at the house, so Roy had run extension cords from his property a few blocks away at 311 Lawn Street into the property at 323 Lawn. 
I'm going to say that there is no way in hell I would have followed the path of that extension cord. Nothing good can be on the other end of that cord. You're in an abandoned house, which the owner has allowed to get more and more dilapidated and run down in the years since he's owned it. And he's running electricity to this house from a house that he owns two blocks away. What could suddenly be so important that if you've worked in this house for a while without electricity, at this moment, you've got to run extension cords outside to get electricity into this dump today? But Officer Drudy follows the cord into the basement. Once he gets downstairs, he sees that attached to the extension cord is an electric saw and some industrial lamps. And there are cages of dead animals down there. Like, this place is a fucking nightmare. So, okay, Roy is supposed to be fixing the house, so maybe the electric saw is a good sign. Yeah, no, no, it's not. It's not a good sign. As Officer Drudy looks further into the room, he sees what at first looks like a mannequin. No, it's, it's not a mannequin. It's a woman. Officer Drudy rushes back outside and immediately grabs Roy Kirk, tells his fellow officers to arrest him. It takes four men to subdue him because he is so out of control. He's screaming, kill me, please kill me. They get him cuffed and shackled and they shove him in the police van. They call the forensic team. Forensic shows up with the medical examiner and what they see in the basement is the stuff of nightmares. The woman in the corner is Ann Hoover, Roy Kirk's neighbor who was supposed to appear in court that morning. Her limbs have been dismembered and wrapped in plastic trash bags. Here's a guy that for years won't do anything with his trash. He gets cited by the health department, but he takes the time to dismember and wrap the body parts of his neighbor in trash bags. What Officer Drudy saw in the corner that he thought was a mannequin was actually Ann Hoover's head and torso that were still intact. There was so much damage to Ann's head and face and there was a noose around her neck. So basically what happened when Officer Drudy walked into Roy Kirk's house a little after 9 a.m., Roy was in the middle of dismembering Ann's body to hide evidence, but he got interrupted before he had a chance to finish. Sweet Lord above. The longer the police search Roy's home, they find something seriously creepy. There's a hole in the wall up along the foundation of the home adjacent to the wall of Ann Hoover's house. The police look up into the hole and they see a tunnel. The police crawl through the tunnel and it connects to Anne's house. Apparently, Roy Kirk dug a tunnel from the foundation of his home under the floor and up into Anne Hoover's home. He broke through the floor in her house, killed her by strangling her, put a rope around her neck, and then dragged her back down through the hole he made in her floor through the tunnel back into his basement. What the actual fuck? While police are investigating the crime scene, Roy Kirk is transferred to the police station. He's in the back of the police van. Remember, his arms are cuffed behind his back and his legs are shackled. It's about a five mile trip from his house to the station closest to Oakland, maybe 10 to 12 minutes. When the police arrive at the station and open the back of the van, Roy Kirk is dead. Somehow, he managed to hang himself with his belt. And the police theory is that even though he only had pants on, he had a belt on those pants. And so with his hands behind his back, he moved his belt inch by inch until the buckle was behind his back. Once he moved his belt, he undid the buckle, slipped the belt out from his pants, and then fished the belt through a metal grating that was on the inside of the back of the van doors. He pushed the belt through the hole, eventually rebuckled it, creating a loop, and then put his head through it and leaned forward to hang himself. That sounds utterly ridiculous to me. And I watched a police reenactment of what they thought Roy did to take his own life. The big difference, though, was the police officer in the reenactment was standing in a stationary van. The van was not moving, and the footage was only from the waist up, so I couldn't tell you one way or another if his ankles were also shackled. Thinking about slipping a loop around your neck, a belt loop, and then leaning forward until you die by hanging yourself, it just doesn't make any sense. And it didn't make any sense to Roy Kirk's father either. He found it completely unbelievable that his son would be able to take his own life in that particular fashion on a 10-minute ride to the police station. 
But Pittsburgh Police Commander Ron Freeman mentioned that officers transport thousands of people a year in those vans. They've never had anything like that happen ever. He also mentioned that Roy Kirk was despondent. When he was brought outside of his home to be arrested, he was screaming for the police to kill him. In the commander's opinion, he wanted to die, and he was determined to kill himself one way or another. There was nothing that the police could have done that would have stopped him. A few weeks after the murder, there was an article in the Reading Eagle newspaper, and Reading is a town to the west of Philadelphia, but nowhere near as far west as Pittsburgh is. And the article discussed how to spot a violent neighbor. They had a forensic psychologist interviewed for this piece. What the doctor said was you don't just go from being a normal, everyday sort of person to the next day deciding to kill your neighbor. And so the issue is how do you know when what seems like normal behavior is really hiding something that could be nefarious and violent and even murderous? And why is it that after the murder is when stories started coming out about neighbors saying that they thought there was something off about Roy? Friends of Anne's shared conversations after the murder where Anne was wondering if she should get a restraining order against Roy. She was honestly concerned for her safety. It also came out after the murder that Roy Kirk was treated for obsessive compulsive disorder and depression. Now, neither of those conditions are precursors to murder. But at what point did he snap? And was it an overnight snap, like the flip of a switch, or was it a gradual transition? There was also talk among law enforcement that this crime may have been premeditated. And, you know, I kind of laughed when I read that. It may have been premeditated. This guy ran a series of extension cords for, I don't know, like a block and a half or two blocks to get electricity into his house. He dug a tunnel from his basement up into Anne's home. If that isn't premeditation, I don't know what the hell is. A neighbor of Anne's who lived behind both houses said that just about a week before the murder, Anne had asked if she could take pictures from his home of the back of both properties. He also mentioned how Anne repeatedly offered to help Roy with the repairs and even offered to buy his home. But then there were other neighbors, again, with a different perspective. A family that lived on the other side of Anne's house talked about how Anne was always taking Kirk to court and that everything he'd worked for his whole life was gone because of her, that she just kept pushing him and pushing him. They even went so far as to say that Anne was not the saint that everyone made her out to be, and Roy was not the monster that everyone said he was. I don't know about you, but I think murdering and chopping up your neighbor is pretty fucking monstrous, regardless of how bitchy she might have been about your leaky roof. And it wasn't just some of the neighbors that had this opinion. I found some posts online, and yeah, I know, the internet is full of a bunch of twisted shit and a bunch of lousy people who say things that they might not otherwise say if they were in front of somebody's face. I'm not going to use any names or any online handles, but there were some comments like, mind your own damn business, here's a lesson for you, don't bother fellow humans. This is a neighborly dispute that ended in murder. Yet people seem to blame Anne for getting herself killed. If I were to try to find a lesson in this story, I think for me it's more about being neighborly. I started this episode by talking about some of my neighbors, and I'm really lucky when I think about my neighbor's husband and the number of times that he's been outside working on his car over the last 11 years and will stop and ask me how my car's running and is there anything that maybe I need that he could help with. I think about neighbors who send me a text and let me know they're on their way to Target and is there anything I need. They check in when my daughter is sick. I'm really blessed. And when you run into trouble, you don't have to be afraid to accept some help that's offered from a neighbor. You know, that's the way things used to be a really long time ago. And I don't understand why it can't be that way now. I realize that makes me sound naive as shit, but I guess that's just who I am. Well, Twisters, thanks for taking this journey with me today out to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, or more specifically, Oakland. And if you do find yourself on the PA Turnpike, I am not kidding. Make sure you have, like, at least 50 bucks on you if you're going across the entire state. I know there's this thing called Easy Pass that isn't just for Pennsylvania, but you can use it from Jersey down into Maryland. I have this weird thing, and so many of my friends make fun of me. I like to talk to toll collectors. I feel like it's a completely thankless job, and I really enjoy taking a minute to say hello, how is your day, thank you so much. So I still don't have Easy Pass. I don't know how many other people there are in Twisted Philly that are like me who aren't using Easy Pass. I'm probably the only idiot that still stops at the toll booths, but I can't be because I see other people stopping at toll booths. But we ventured a little further out of the city than we have before, and I hope you enjoyed the trip.
One other thing I want to talk about before I say goodbye, Halloween is not that far away and there is some flipping incredible twisted shit and things to do in Philly around Halloween. And I'm taking requests. So if there's anything that you've been curious about, like Eastern State Penitentiary, actually your curiosity will be fulfilled because there's going to be an episode about Eastern State coming up pretty soon. But if there's anything you've been curious about with a Halloween twist in or around the city of Philadelphia or Pennsylvania at large, shoot me a post on Twitter, drop me a note on Facebook. You can also email me at twistedphilly at outlook.com. Let me know if there's something you want to hear as we get ready for Halloween. That's all from me for today. Ciao for now, twisters.